Hello there, all of you absolutely lovely people. Once again, this is Dax, and today we're going to talk about Simon Conway Morris. Now, Simon Conway Morris is an interesting man. I consider him to be downright fascinating. He is, on one hand, an evolutionary biologist, while on the other hand, also a Christian. So it's interesting that you've got this dichotomy going on within this one individual. Do you as a Christian believer and a Cambridge professor in the sciences find it difficult to work with both of those things side by side? Well, I don't personally. No doubt some of my colleagues do. In a way, what I see is that there's a lot in common between the theology and the science. First of all, of course, I think the universe is created out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo. Correspondingly, I think that the world is organized in a rational fashion. But I think you have to be extremely careful not to use any of that as a proof of God. God, apart from anything else, so far as I don't understand him, is other, completely other. But there are at least consistencies in the terms of how the world is organized. Physics and chemistry are pretty comfortable with that, and such things as fine-tuning, for example. Again, do not use a theological argument, but you can at least say it is curious that our universe is organized in such a fashion. We have the curiosity that we're alive, which we take for granted. We don't really understand, first of all, what life is. We recognize it straight away, but we don't understand a very strange sort of metastable jelly, if you like. And also, of course, most astonishingly, some parts of that life have become self-aware and can reflect on themselves and so forth. And that can then be used to say, well, remind ourselves that I think without exception, all human societies are religious. That is that, you know, the sense not only of dealing with, dare I say, the commonplace, death, bereavement, birth, rites of passage, those sorts of things, extremely important, but more especially just a sense of the other, the sense of the numinous, the sense that there are places in the world which are genuinely holy. Now, a materialist would regard these as aberrations, but to many people, I think, they're not simply mistakes of a misfiring brain. I think they actually articulate deeper realities. And he's gotten a lot of flack for that. A lot of people who seem to think that he's a traitor in some way, which that alone is a fundamental flaw in our civilization, that everybody is always locked into this us versus them, you're either with us or you're the enemy mentality. But Simon Conway Morris, just like many scientists alive today, have managed to bridge the gap between the two and be both. But what's most interesting about Simon Conway Morris is not that he is both a Christian and an evolutionary biologist at the same time. What's interesting about Simon Conway Morris is his theory of evolutionary convergence. Let me attempt to explain exactly what evolutionary convergence is. You see, Standard evolutionary biologists believe that evolution is just a series of random experiments and that evolution can go off in any direction. Basically, according to standard evolution, the belief is, is that if you have two planets that are basically identical in terms of size, density, which equals gravity, chemical composition, kinds of materials available on the surface, about the same distance from their star, and their star is about the same. According to standard evolution, they predict that these two very similar planets would create completely different life forms because evolution is completely random. Evolutionary convergence says the opposite. According to Simon Conway Morris, according to evolutionary convergence, evolution will always produce the same solution to the same problem when faced with the same circumstances. Even though you have an infinite number of possibilities available, there is only one, two, possibly three that work the best. Because there is only one solution that works best, evolutionary convergence says that two planets that are of the same size, same density, equals gravity, about the same distance from their star, and their star is about the same kind of star, they have the same kind of chemical components available on the surface, 
According to evolutionary convergence, these two planets will create life forms that are so similar to each other that it is eerie. Um, aliens, according to some people, will be genuinely alien. In fact, as I've mentioned elsewhere, it might be that perhaps many, many centuries in the future we come back from an expedition and we give something to a mineralogist and then he rings us up the next day and says, by the way, you've just brought back an alien. In other words, it may be so different from what we expect that we will really have to throw away all our assumptions. I, uh, perhaps because I work in Cambridge and therefore very, very conservative, no, no, it's not quite like that, but I am more conservative because I think evolution by and large is constrained. Uh, to some extent, my colleagues would agree with me. They would say, for the most part, not everybody, that life really has to, as NASA has said, follow the water. And it's also got to be based on carbon. Carbon's wonderfully versatile because it forms chains and, and rings and all that sort of thing. Other people say maybe silica-based life, but for various reasons, I think that's less likely. But I would go much further than that because I would argue that effectively life has so few options that in fact, if you want to learn how to swim, how to fly, how to walk, if you want to learn how to breathe, if you want to even learn how to reproduce even things which go down to rather subtle business about why we have sexes and things like that, even the nature of the chromosomes on this planet actually have various sorts of predictabilities about them. And I'm taking a gamble here, and most likely I will never know, because if we ever do detect alien life, it may be centuries away, even now. But I think that when we do detect alien life, it will be, well, strikingly, embarrassingly, well, it'll be like us. And Simon Conway Morris is a man who has spent time out in nature, studying nature. He, he hasn't spent all of his time sitting behind a desk theorizing based on other people's data. He has gone out and gathered this data himself. There are about 16 different ways that you can make a functioning eye. And yet in nature, evolution has repeatedly produced basically only two types of eye. Nature has produced the eyeball, like ours, the lens-based eye, and nature has produced the compound eye, like what you find on insects. There, there are a few other deviations from that, but almost every living thing on Earth has one of these two kinds of eye. And these eyes are produced regardless of their starting point. For example, you take a human being and you take an octopus. An octopus and a human being. We both have eyeball lens type eyes. Our eyes work the same. The light passes through the lens, through the pupil, onto the retina on the back of the eye where the image is processed into data that the brain can use. Our eyes are made out of about the same materials. They look very similar. They function the same way. They're about the same distance from the brain. And yet, in terms of evolution, our closest common relative had no eyes whatsoever. The human being and the octopus are two beings who came up with the exact same ability to perceive the world around us from completely different starting points. One of the interesting consequences that this has, and to my knowledge, Simon Conway Morris has never really gone there with this subject. He's probably tried to avoid it. But if you look at ufology, one of the things that some skeptics point out as a reason why so much of ufology is crap is the fact that you have so many species out there that look exactly like us. The Pleiadians are described to look like human beings. Not exactly like us, but so much like us that one could walk down the street and they might catch a few looks, but we would never question that they were human. Same thing with the Lyrans. Same thing with several other species that have been brought up. A lot of skeptics have used the idea of these extraterrestrials that have been reported as looking too much like us as proof that it is all crap. Evolutionary convergence, on the other hand, says that it is actually likely under the condition that we come from planets that are about the same in terms of gravity, chemical composition, 
and the star that they orbit. Now, of course, this is operating outside of the idea of interspecies genetic manipulation and planting your DNA on other worlds, things like that. All of this is outside of it. According to evolutionary convergence, two planets can produce the same kinds of species simply because evolution will always come to the same solution when faced with the same problem when under the same circumstances. So anyway, I just thought that this would be an interesting subject to discuss. Please feel free to comment below. Please keep the comments civil. I am not interested in trolls or arguing, so mind your manners, but feel free to voice your opinion below. Once again, I am Dax Allred. Always remember, you are important, you are loved, your needs are valid, but the same is also true of everyone else. We're all in this together, we all matter. I love you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.